Good evening. Thank you all for joining us this, this evening. My name is Georgette V. Hill. I'm the Senior Director for Alumni Engagement and Outreach here at Colorado Law. Uh, during the presentation, you can ask questions. There's a Q&A function uh, in the bottom center area of, of the format here, and people can vote on questions. The questions with the most votes uh, uh, are the ones that you have the most interest in. And Anne England and Anne Marie Moyes will respond to your questions during the presentation. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Siddhartha Rathod, Colorado Law Class 2007, and the immediate past chair of the Law Alumni Board. Siddhartha. Thank you, Georgette. Uh, welcome to the Colorado Law Talk series. This is the first time the Colorado Law Talks has been held virtually. Uh, obviously, because of the COVID situation, we couldn't all gather in one place and hear what these two incredible speakers and professors at the CU Law School have to say. But under Dean and I as leadership and with the assistance of some amazing uh, support teams, at CU Law School, we were able to present this virtually, which has allowed us to have an excess of 455 attendees via Zoom. Uh, attendees are all across the country from DC to California. So this is really kind of a great uh, opportunity for us to not only get the message out there about the wonders of CU Law School, but also to uh, spread some education about wrongful conviction wrongful convictions, excuse me. Uh, this topic has a personal interest to me in that I am a attorney at the law firm of Rathad Muhammad Bai, where we focus on civil rights. Uh, and it also has a personal connection to me uh, because uh, Anne England, 16 years ago when she joined the law school, uh, was my clinical professor uh, in the uh, criminal defense clinic which is what caused me to become a public defender at the start of my career and to get to the unfortunate opportunity to firsthand see the harms of wrongful conviction. Uh, I then had the opportunity of meeting dinner at Anne's house, Anne England's house, uh, a, a few years back, and that was another opportunity to firsthand see the horrors of wrongful convictions. It's also my pleasure today to introduce Dean and Naya, uh, who has been the Dean of Colorado Law School since 2017. Uh, and Dean and I introducing our two key speakers today is very appropriate as he is an internationally recognized scholar and author in the areas of international human rights and issues concerning indigenous people. And as I'm sure, sure will be touched on today, the issues of wrongful conviction uh, often are overrepresented in minority communities. So uh, Dean and I is especially appropriate person uh, to have introduce our speakers. He also served as the United Nations Special Repertoire on the Rights of Indigenous People from 2008 to 2014. In addition to his teachings and scholarship, Dean and I has litigated cases involving the human rights of Indigenous people in domestic and international tribunals. Uh, without further ado, further ado Dean Anaya. Uh, thank you, Siddhartha. And uh, welcome everybody to this evening's Colorado Law Talk, uh, which is our first for, via this medium Zoom. And by participating, you're getting a bit of the taste of what uh, life and classes and instruction are like at the, and meetings as well uh, at, at the law school these days. And as I think you'll see, um, while not a perfect medium, this medium is really quite amazing in bringing people together and allowing us to interact and learn and, uh, from each other, uh, uh, even remotely. Uh, as Siddhartha said, the topic of this evening's Colorado Law Talk is uh, wrongful convictions. Um, before we get started, I want to wish each of you and your families and loved ones uh, the very best uh, during the extraordinary and uh, challenging time we're living. And at the same time, I want to recognize those uh, many in our communities or families who, who are suffering illness, loss, or other hardship. Our thoughts are with them. 
The Colorado Law Talk series was launched in 2017 um, as, a, as a means of sharing the groundbreaking research and work of our faculty with the legal community uh, beyond the law school, especially in Denver. Uh, given our remote format today, we're happy to also welcome many of our students, faculty and staff, as well as others locally and from around the country. The mission of Colorado Law is threefold, uh, providing an exceptional legal education, uh, advancing new ideas and knowledge through research and discovery, and putting our knowledge and resources to the service, service of society uh, at the local, national, and even international levels. The Corey Wise Innocence Project is an outstanding example of the law school's public service mission in action. By providing assistance to incarcerated individuals with credible claims of innocence, the project seeks to advance legal remedies to both human error and to systemic flaws in the criminal justice system. This is work for which all of us in the law school can be immensely proud. This evening's speakers are responsible for the ongoing success of the project and for engaging our students in it. Each one's extraordinary passion and dedication to this vitally important work, I'm sure, will be obvious to, to everyone participating uh, this evening. Now, I, I won't go into their biographical information because you have that uh, available to you in detail. It's now my pleasure to call on clinical professor of law, Anne England, and program director of the Corey Weiss Innocence Project, Anne-Marie Moyes. Welcome, Anne and Anne-Marie. Hello. Oh. Um, thank you so much for coming. And um, we really appreciate your interest. And it's fun to see how many different people and how many people are interested in this topic that I know myself and Anne-Marie hold dear to our hearts and um, our time. I thought I would kick things off a little bit by telling you just a tiny bit of history about the Corey Wise Innocence Project and how it got to where it is today um, with having such a wonderful director of Anne-Marie in place. So the Innocence Project of Colorado was something that was started many years ago by someone named Jim Scarborough. And I'm not sure if folks out there know who he is, but he's a pretty amazing person who was a partner at Arnold and Porter and I believe is still of counsel there. He one time was at a meeting at the Colorado Lawyers Committee and they started talking about the issues being raised in the community about wrongful convictions. And so he said, so don't you think, um, sorry, don't you think that we should do something about this to this group of people? And there was silence in the room. And so Jim, even though he had no background in that area, obviously he's an experienced attorney, but had no background in that area, decided, well, I guess I will. So he pulled together a committee of people, um, experienced trial lawyers, criminal lawyers, criminal investigators, and they formed a committee that met regularly. Um, and that group of people, and it was really Jim along with his secretary, would patients from people in prison who stated that they were there and they were innocent. And they, um, would answer those letters and they would work through these. And some cases that I think folks in Colorado have heard of, one of which is the Tim Masters case, would come through there and then get assigned an attorney from there who'd work on the case. And that's how it lived for about 15 years. Then Jim was deciding to move on and retire or step down a little bit from his position at Arnold and Porter, and I believe go to of counsel, and ask Pat Furman, who many of you may know as well, who is a clinical professor for about 25 years um, at CU, and if he would take the project and bring it to CU. Um, Dean Getches um, agreed to that, and Pat took it. But I'm sure many of you know, but Pat left fairly soon after that. He retired, <laughs> and like many things dear to Pat, they were also dear to me. So I took that on as one of my volunteer responsibilities at the law school, and we worked on it for a little while. Right around there, um, there was a notice that went out that was being put out by a project called the DNA Justice Review Project. And I said, hey, you guys should mention the Colorado Innocence Project. We still exist. And in their literature, they sent out a little postcard. Little did I know that we were going to get around 5,000 postcards back from inmates in the Colorado Department of Corrections 
many of them saying nothing else other than I'm innocent, please help me. <laughs> and following that, it became desperately apparent that it could not be a little side volunteer project that I could do at the law school. And so at that point, Dean Weiser was there and he and I went about trying to raise some money. Um, luckily during that time, um, I had a great conversation with Burton Islandic and um, she introduced me to a pretty amazing woman named Jane Fisher by Ryelson, who's an attorney here in Colorado now, but at the time was in New York and represented Corey Wise. Um, through her, um, we were able to talk to Corey about the desire to start a project. And he gave us the initial seed money for the project and continues to support us to this day. Um, and we were able to hire our first director and became the Corey Wise Innocent Project. And that was Christy Martinez, who has now become a judge in Boulder. This past March, we were lucky enough, or a year ago, March, I guess now, we are lucky enough to hire Anne Marie Moyes to come to the project and be our new director. Um, at the end of the project, she's going to talk about some of the specific things that we're working on as a project. But now we're going to get started and just talk to you about wrongful convictions themselves. So if you want to go to the slide. So how often do wrongful convictions happen? Um, studies, as you can see on the slide, suggest that wrongful convictions occur in about 5% of the criminal cases. So I thought one of the things I would do is try and give you some kind of perspective about that in Colorado. Um, in 2018, there are 108, 373 convictions in the state of Colorado. First of all, just hearing that number was fairly overwhelming to me, but <laughs> once I did get used to that number, I saw that 5% of that would mean that there were 5,418 people in Colorado that are serving some type of sentence, so whether that be probation or prison or jail time for a crime that they did not commit. So what are the primary causes of wrongful conviction? So, or the contributing factors. Um, so when wrongful conviction started to really come to light, I think as people know historically, it really came through the use and the trusting of DNA. And so those are what are called DNA exonerations. And those cases started coming to the forefront as, um, as they started having types of DNA they could test in particular cases. Those cases were primarily really large cases such as sexual assaults, homicides, those types of cases. And what they started finding was that in 70% of those cases, eyewitness misidentification was the, one of the primary factors or contributing factors in those types of wrongful convictions. Then there was flawed forensic evidence, false confessions, incentivized witnesses. I think folks would know that more as being um, snitch witnesses, potentially, <laughs> um, or other types of witnesses. Um, and that official misconduct, and then inadequate defense counsel. But after folks started realizing that there were people sitting in prisons that were on death row, that were, had actually already been killed or had died, that were innocent and could be proven. Many other cases started coming to light and those were the non-DNA exonerations. Um, and so when they did that, as you can see, there was a different set of um, contributing factors. And so it, in some sense, you'll understand why. I, picked a few to see why perjury or false accusation and really official misconduct would have moved to the top of being reasons or contributing factors in it. And I looked back and um, thought of two very big cases that many of you might remember. And I'm not sure if folks remember in Los Angeles, a, criminal, a unit of criminal investigators called the Rampart Division. Um, and that was a group of detectives and police officers that were um, creating evidence, that were planting evidence, that were giving false perjured testimony. And when they went back through those officers' cases, they exonerated 106 people as a result of the investigation that they did. Very similar in my hometown of Philadelphia, um, there was a set of police officers that were called the Four Horsemen of the Ap Apocalypse. And after looking into the cases that they had worked on and given admittedly planted evidence on people, planted guns, perjured themselves, 
they actually um, overturned 300 convictions and they believe that about 100 of those people were just purely innocent. So those are very different than the DNA exonerations that are coming from things such as testing semen samples, testing blood samples that they then could do with more modern technology. But again, it's really breaking through and having witnesses that come forward and show that there are wrongful convictions. I wanted to talk to you for just a little minute about the structure of our talk because that would lead to this. What we decided to do was to look at three of these um, factors that have played into wrongful convictions and go into depth about them. Um, and so you'll see us talking about eyewitness identification, um, false confession cases, and then flawed forensics. Obviously, there's not time for us to go through each and every particular factor in today's conversation. So I'm going to now talk for a little bit about false confessions. Um, this is an area that people always find really fascinating um, because I think it's so counterintuitive um, to think that somebody would falsely confess to a crime. And I think all of us believe that it's something that we would never do. Um, or at least we believe that except for threats of violence or actually um, police officers being violent, that we would never um, succumb to that kind of pressure to give a false confession. But the truth is that most false confessions happen based merely on psychological coercion. And we're coming to understand this more through so many exonerations in cases where there was in fact a confession. So to understand the psychological coercion at play, you kind of have to understand how interrogations are conducted in the United States. Um, police all over this country are trained in a method of interrogation that's called the read technique. And these are sort of the components of it. So what police are first trained to do is to make an assessment of whether their suspect is being deceptive. But the kind of things that they're trained to look for are things as simple as touching your glasses, shifting in your seat, appearing nervous. So you can imagine that most people, if they're being questioned by the police, are going to exhibit these kind of characteristics. And so even though police are trained to put a lot of weight into those kind of signals, um, there's actually been studies that show that this technique that police are taught of assessing deceptiveness is not at all reliable, that in fact, it's no better than a coin toss. Um, but once police decide that their suspect is being deceptive, then what they're trained to do is engage in this technique where first they isolate the suspect. So most typically, the suspect would be brought to the police station, put in a windowless small room, and made to feel like they were trapped and isolated in this room. And then two things happen. The first is that police are trained to make that suspect feel hopeless. And there are two ways that they do that. One is they maximize the evidence against the, the, the suspect. So they make that person believe that the evidence is simply overwhelming against them. And the thing that most people find really shocking is it is completely legal in the United States for police to lie about the evidence. So they can lie about evidence and tell a suspect, we tested the DNA and it's come back to match you. And so in this way, by telling those sort of lies, they can both distort that person's sense of reality and they can in fact make them feel pretty hopeless. The other thing that police are trained to do in this technique is to shut down any denials. So if a person truly is innocent and they keep responding to every question and trying to explain where they were or that they couldn't have done it, the detectives are trained to just immediately shut that down and not let them um, expound on that kind of denial. And then the next thing that they do is they make the suspect feel that giving a confession is really their best option. And so a couple ways that they do this is they minimize moral culpability. So they float different ideas that might diminish that person's moral responsibility for what they supposedly did. So the police might say something like, maybe it was just an accident, or we know you committed this crime with two other people. Um, maybe you weren't as responsible and what we need you to do is just tell us what they did. And often the police will also at least imply leniency. If you just cooperate with us, you won't face the death penalty or we'll be able to talk to the prosecutor and it will matter that you were helpful. 
And so when this kind of technique is used, not just for one hour, not just for two hours, but hour upon hour, it starts to really wear people down. And more than you might believe, um, a lot of us are susceptible to this technique and will give a false confession. So if you look at proven examples of false confessions, they do have certain common features. One is that most false confessions are transient. And so what that means is the person gives a false confession out of this sense of hopelessness and just wanting to make the interrogation stop. But then once it does stop, or once they get an attorney, they immediately retract the confession. The other thing that's very shocking is that the confessions are often very detailed, and that's what, what makes them really difficult when they're presented before a jury. So it's not just that the person says, yes, I did it. They've been questioned over the course of hours, and over that conversation or interrogation with the police, they've learned a lot of details about this crime, and they are able to weave these details into their account. So it's very striking um, to just see how detailed these confessions are and, are and are, and it's also very hard to get your head around how an innocent person could um, admit to doing some really awful things in their confession in great detail. They're also extremely potent evidence. And so once you have a confession in a case, it's an almost impossible case to win at trial. There are examples um, where somebody gave a false confession and there was even DNA evidence that was exculpatory. And despite the exculpatory DNA, juries still convicted based on the confession evidence. It's just very hard for, the, for juries to rationalize how an innocent person would confess. We've also learned um, through all of these exonerations some offender characteristics and um, some aspects of the conditions of interrogation that make false confessions more likely. So one thing we've learned is that longer interrogations are more likely to produce a false confession. There was one study of 125 false confessions and the average length of the interrogations was over 16 hours. So again, you just have to imagine when I describe this technique is you're not talking about being in this small windowless room for just an hour being berated by the police and lied to. You're, imagine that going on for 16 hours. Um, there are also certain populations that are simply more vulnerable. And this does make sense that juveniles would be more vulnerable, people with a cognitive impairment or a mental illness. So you see um, more false confessions involving those populations. So now what I want to do is just give you an example, because there's something about individual stories that just bring it home in a different kind of way. Um, Marty Tankleff is somebody who was wrongly convicted of murdering his parents in New York State in 1990. So Marty was just 17 years old. He was still in high school. And by his account, he woke up one morning and found his mother murdered and his father seriously wounded, and he called the police. Um, and he very quickly told the police that he thought his father's business partner, a man named Jerry Stornerman, was the likely perpetrator. And Marty believed this because um, Mr. Stornerman had threatened his father. Um, and he thought that, um, he, that Mr. Stornerman had a motive possibly to kill his father because he owed his father quite a bit of money. Um, but the police focused exclusively on Marty right from the beginning despite mounting evidence that pointed to Storyman. So within a week of the crime, Mr. Storyman um, changed his appearance, faked his own death, and fled to California. But despite that evidence, the police in their tunnel vision just kept focusing on Marty and Marty alone. And within hours of the crime, they brought him to the police station and questioned him for several hours. And what's most disturbing is that about two hours into the interview, the detectives told Marty a series of lies. So at that point, what Marty knew is that his mother was dead and that his father was in the hospital in critical condition. So one of the police officers went out into the hallway and faked a telephone call with the hospital. And then he came back in and he told Marty, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that your father woke up. The bad news is that he said that you did it. And then the police also told Marty 
that there were hairs in his mother's hand and that the hairs matched him. Marty had told them that he had not taken a shower that morning and um, they were pressing him about that because he did not have any blood on his clothes. And they told him, Marty, we did a humidity test in your bathroom and it proves that you did take a shower. So all of these were lies, but you can imagine a 17 year old child and how they might respond to that, those kind of interrogation techniques. This was Marty's response. My father never lies. Could I have blocked out, blacked out? Could I have been possessed? And then he confessed, stated that, stating that he needed psychiatric help. He spent 17 years in prison before he was exonerated. He was lucky to have some people who really believed in him and hired a private investigator. And they came up with some overwhelming new evidence that implicated Mr. Storyerman as the real perpetrator. So now we're going to turn to the next um, contributing factor eyewitness misidentification. So eyewitness misidentification is one I think that has been in the media quite a bit. Um, and there's some different factors that go into when eyewitnesses misidentify their perpetrators. The first one we're gonna talk about is memory. And the reason that we're gonna talk about memory and the use of memory and how it relates to eyewitness identification is a bit of thinking about how this testimony comes out in the courtroom. If you think about it, what generally happens is that a witness will be questioned right after a crime happens. And that witness will say, give a description of the person as best the detail they are. And assuming that the person, and again, most 90% of eyewitness misidentifications are ones that the person it, who they're accusing or is accused of the crime is a stranger, someone they've never met, obviously. Um, so they're describing someone they haven't seen and they give a description. And at some point they're called into the police department and they undergo some type of a procedure. Now the procedures can range from anything to a one-on-one -on -one show up, which means that they just look at someone, the police takes them to someone directly and says, is this the guy who did it? Um, all the way up to um, the photographic lineups you've probably seen on television or the, um, the, where they line up a people, a live lineup where they um, look at the different people and the witness picks out a person of the lineup. And then normally they're asked, how confident are you in that? And so if you think about this, um, the, the tools that are being used by that person, it's a question of memory. How good is that person's memory? Then later in court, they'll be asked to, again, describe the person who did this to them and look at the person sitting in the courtroom and there'll be a big dramatic moment where the prosecutor will ask, is that the person who did this to you? Do you recognize anyone in the courtroom as the person who did this? And from the witness stand, the person on the stand will look at the defendant if there is a conviction and point at them and say, are you, yes, he's sitting right there. Can you describe something the person's wearing? They'll describe something and point at them and say, that's the person who did this to me. Prosecutor will ask, are you sure? Yes, that's the person who did this to me. And so if you think about that, the biggest thing that person is relying on is their memory, their memory of what the person looked like, their memory of the circumstances around, um, how they remember that, the lighting, all of the different types of things that they are. So I think the first thing that we're gonna talk about is memory. And so to do this, I'm gonna ask a question, or there'll be a question that will come up for all of you. And I just ask you to do a quick poll. They are yes or no questions. Questions. We'll get to see the answer to the poll and then I'll talk a little bit about the topic. So we could do the first question. So the question is human memory works like a video camera, accurately recording the events seen so we can review and inspect them later. Yes or no? So go ahead and vote. There it is. The results will come up here in just a second. We're waiting for the results. Oh. 
Okay, so it sounds like most people, there we go. <laughs> so we have a well-educated group, <laughs> that's true. Um, the answer to that is no, that our memory, and I think there's a lot more about this in the news lately, but that our memories in fact don't function as a video camera or as a video or camera. That memory is something that is constructed. Um, and one of the biggest things that our brains do during the course of something happening, anything happening, but the more traumatic, the more likely it is to happen, is that your brain starts to fill in the gaps. Um, your brain is trying to make sense of the situation and create an entire or a whole picture um, of what happened. And so often some of the details, if you can't see or you can't remember, um, can be influenced things by things such as your expectations, your desires, um, where your attention was focused on. Um, and that the other thing that I think people find um, surprising is that your memory can be easily tainted by post-incident events. So for example, what's the first thing you do? You call the police and you talk to them. And those people start to give you information. Now, of course, they're not giving you information with the intent or with the desire to make what you're remembering not accurate or not true. They are trying to learn information. So it's an exchange of information. When you go down to that police station and you look at the photographic lineup, the officer often knows who they believe at that moment is the suspect. And they'll put it in a number, a group of six people and you'll be looking at it as a witness. And as many witnesses say, they believe by the fact that there are those six pictures there, that the question they are supposed to answer is not, are one of these six people the person who did it, but which person amongst these six is the person who committed the offense? And um, so in looking at the six, they'll often pick the person they think is closest to the person that they remember. And that becomes imprinted. Then the next powerful thing that happens often in these types of situations is that the police will often give the person some feedback, something very innocuous, such as, oh good, that's the person we were looking at. And that creates another circumstance where your brain starts to look at the picture and say, oh, that's the person, that's the face that makes sense of this situation. And it's not just me as a witness, it's me and the police. They clearly have other evidence or else why would they have put his picture in there? And it starts to become a cyclical loop that reinforces that image into your brain. Okay, we'll do the second one. So the confidence of an individual witness on their identification of a person is a good indicator of their accuracy. So go ahead and vote. response. Oh, okay. So no, again, you guys are good at this. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but the confidence of a person is very persuasive to juries. Um, and it's something that in the past was seen as the great indicator of a person's ability or how accurate the identification was or the memory was of the person. But what they found in doing sort of doing these studies about whether that's true is that really what it gauges is a, person's, a person's individual confidence in their ability generally to identify someone. And it's very hard to distinguish between the two. Meaning that if I am personally a person who I, I believe I'm very bad at identifying people. So if some a police officer said, well, is, are you sure that's the person? I'd be like, I don't know, maybe, probably. I would probably say I am. Even if there were independent evidence, they're a video, I would still be nervous because I don't feel I'm good at it. Versus some people believe that they are very good at it. And then there's also continues to be the rule of that feedback loop that's being given by the officer. They've gotten some feedback from an officer and that has to do sometimes with how they confident are. But if you think about a case where the primary evidence is that person's testimony, the jury and a person sitting on the stand talking to the jury and the 
the prosecutor asked them, how confident are you that it's that man sitting right there across from you? And they look at each other and the witness said, I'm positive, that's him. That evidence is very powerful in a courtroom setting. And it is also very persuasive to many people. Okay, we'll do the next one. So the question is, once you've experienced an event and formed a strong memory of that event, that memory does not change. Okay, and what I'd like to just do is the last one too. I put this in here as well, just to give you another information. So let's do the final one and then I'll talk about them together because they're very related. And so this just adds on the layer, if it's an emotional event from the past that we think back to regularly, is it more likely to be ac an accurate memory than an event that we just remember out of the blue? So suddenly I remember my fifth birthday party and I think about some details from that. Is that a more accurate memory likely or one that I've thought about um, regularly or often and that the event I'm thinking about is emotional one that I'm looking back to? So go ahead and vote on that. <laughs> okay, I think you guys are cheating, but <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So both of these questions are very um, interrelated to each other. Um, and again, they have to do with a bit of what we talked about in the first question, but it really is how we, our brains record memory, how we record events that happen. Um, and as I mentioned the first one, it becomes progressive. We're very influenced by, um, by things that happen afterwards. It's been described a bit, of, a bit like opening an old file on a computer, that every single time that memory is opened, it's very vulnerable. It's in a very vulnerable state. It can be edited, it can be changed, it can be deleted, it can be overwritten. Um, and this is a process that they call reconsolidation of the memory. So each time we pull it up, essentially, we look at it, we throw it around in our head. And during those moments, that is times that it's very likely to change. And those are often moments that more information can get added in. So let's say that you go to a criminal case and the victim in the case is allowed to attend the proceedings, which they are under the Victims Rights Act in Colorado and most states. And so they show up and they sit there and they watch the person being brought in and sit at the table that says defendant. And they watch his lawyer argue some things and they just look at that person. That's rewriting it. It's, it's another opportunity for that face to become a part of the case. And, in, and think about all the details you can get by just watching someone. So you notice something about their, the shape of their head. You notice something about their hands. You notice facts about that person that you didn't actually know before, but they become part of the memory that you have. And those facts can be very persuasive in talking about a case. And so studies have actually shown that those strange memories that just pop up to us out of the past are often more likely in terms of the details that you have to actually be more accurate because you haven't thought about them before. So it's the first time opening up that file, and you may not have a lot of details of them, then oddly the ones that you are thinking about and perseverating about regularly. Okay, I'm gonna do the next slide. So I just want to talk about a couple other factors that can affect memory. So obviously, most of the crimes we're talking about are fairly violent or fairly serious crimes. And high levels of stress actually diminish an eyewitness's ability to recall and make accurate identifications. Um, and I think that, that this is one that people find surprising. I think that there is a belief that our attention to detail grows as we are more stressed. And so we become more and more um, 
invested and more attuned to it. But in fact, stress really does get in the way of our ability to remember and kind of record that information into our brain accurately. Okay, the next one. Then I think pr people have probably heard of the weapon focus. Um, and so as it says, and particularly in events of short duration, weapons can can distract witnesses and draw a person's attention away from the perpetrator, impairing their ability to subsequently make a reliable identification. And I think, again, there's a bit of this that's counterintuitive because I think people believe that they're looking at the person's face, but in reality, especially in events that are quick, that are very violent, um, often what they're doing is paying attention to the thing that might kill them. So it makes a bunch of sense. But um, in one perspective, but I think for a witness themselves, it's fairly, fairly counterintuitive. Next one. Um, the same, um, there's been a lot of um, studies that have been done that disguises such as, uh, as simple as a hat or sunglasses, sorry, can greatly reduce accuracy um, in our ability to describe. So whether someone just even puts on a clear pair of glasses, it distorts, especially for a stranger that we're looking at, it distorts our ability to accurately um, pick them out of a line or, or see them later. Now, this is obviously one that has been talked about in the media quite a bit, but it's one that uh, is very prominent. Cross-racial identifications are significantly less re reliable. Um, and that's been shown kind of against ev about every racial group and that we're just less accurate in describing, we're less accurate in seeing, we're less accurate in correctly identifying someone of a different race. Um, that also is true across age identification. Um, they think it probably has something to do with what people are often used to looking at, but it really is something that can reduce the reliability of the identification significantly. And then I think this is one that I've talked about quite a bit, is that a witness's account as well as their confidence can really be impaired by the information that they receive right afterwards and really the continuing information that they receive throughout the course of the case. Um, I wanted to talk for a second just about kind of an experiment that was done that I thought was sort of interesting that um, highlights this a little bit. Um, there was a professor that asked their students to talk about, um, to imagine a car accident that they had seen and from different witnesses. And during the course of it, as she asked them, she started saying, so when the, or to describe a car accident that they had seen. So when the person passed the red barn or when the driver passed the red barn, when this person passed the red barn and they started suggesting into it fairly early on that there was in fact a red barn. The truth was that there was no red barn at all in it, but in all of their accounts throughout the course of it, this, the people started to pick up on the fact and just include that into it. It's fairly simplistic, but it gives you an idea of how we can easily incorporate information into our descriptions of a person, of a scene, of a situation. Now I think we're gonna move on to first video. We're just waiting for the video to play. There we go. It was an early in the morning. I felt something in my room, something brushed my arm. And when I looked over the side of the bed, I noticed it was a person's head. And that's when I said, who is that? Who's there? And he immediately sprang up on the bed and um, straddled my body and put a knife to my throat and told me to shut up or he was going to kill me. Over the next 20 minutes um, during the assault as he raped me, I um, made two decisions. One is if there was a way I could live, I would figure it out. And if I lived, I wanted to memorize everything about this person. So I began to um, pay really close attention to details about his face and his eyes and his voice and his hair and how much he weighed, the clothing he was wearing. She was able to provide a, a detailed description, not only in terms of his physical appearance, but also 
what he wore at the time of the uh, assault, it uh, was clear to me that she had an ample opportunity to see him. Coupled with her determination and presence of mind, I was convinced without a doubt that she could identify her assailant. We received an anonymous tip that Ronald Cotton not only fit the composite in terms of appearance, but the general description of the assailant. We had his photo on file and we felt like he could be a good suspect in this particular case and thought that we should do a photographic lineup. Within two days, I was asked to come down and look at a photo array. The officer said, we're going to show you six photographs. Don't feel compelled to choose any one. The suspect may or may not be in there. When you're in a police department and there's a photo lineup, there's this sense that one of these has got to be their suspect, and it's my job to find him. I began to narrow it down. I could very quickly discount four of them, narrowing it down to two photographs. According to the records, Jennifer examined the two photographs for four to five minutes. Research shows that memory is highly malleable and that an eyewitness who is uncertain can become much more certain over time. I noticed that she did focus on uh, photograph number four, four bit, then moved over to uh, Ronald Cotton's photograph, which I think was number six, before picking it up and saying that this was the man who raped me. And I wanted to be very confident and very sure, so I took my time. And that's when I held up the picture of Ronald Cotton and said, this is the man who did this. They said, are you sure? And I said, I'm positive. And they looked at me and said, we thought that was the guy. Since the officers present knew that Ronald Cotton was the suspect um, in this case, it's possible that they unconsciously provided information to Jennifer Thompson. And we do know that Jennifer Thompson's confidence was influenced by the positive feedback that she did receive after making her identification. In laboratory studies, researchers compare groups of participants who receive feedback to individuals who did not receive that kind of information in a control group. And what we know is that people who receive feedback, their confidence skyrockets, just like it did for Jennifer Thompson after her identification in this case. And there was this huge relief that washed over me because I had gotten it right. On August 8th, 11 days after the assault, Jennifer Thompson was brought in to view a physical lineup consisting of seven men. Ronald Cotton was the only lineup participant whose picture had been present in the photo array that Jennifer Thompson saw. And repeating only one individual in multiple procedures increases witness confidence even when that witness is wrong. And as we walked out of the room, I remember looking at the officer saying, how did I do? Did I do okay? And one of the officers said, you did great. That was the guy you picked out in the photo lineup. By the time she testified in court and identified Ronald Cotton as her assailant, she was 100% certain. Ronald Cotton's conviction was based primarily on the eyewitness identification evidence of Jennifer Thompson. But we know that Ronald Cotton was completely innocent of this crime. He was exonerated based on DNA evidence in June 1995. At the same time, it was learned that another man who was in prison for very similar crime was actually the person who raped Jennifer Thompson. I can remember thinking to myself, if that's wrong, if Bobby Poole raped me and it wasn't Ronald Cotton, then maybe everything I thought was true is not true. Well, she just made an honest mistake. I was lucky that that was DNA evidence. Okay, so moving on to our next contributing factor, flawed forensics. Um, I think, you know, if you pay attention to TV alone, you would think that forensic science is magic that can solve any case with absolute certainty. But the truth is, um, the more that we examine the state of forensics in the United States, the more we learn that it is um, not nearly as reliable as we'd, we'd hope. Um, in 2009, the National Academy of Sciences um, issued a report. They were commissioned by Congress to study the state of forensic science in the United States. And they came out with this report that was really scathing. And this is a quote from the conclusion of the report. With the exception of nuclear DNA analysis, no forensic method 
has been rigorously shown to have the capacity to consistently and with a high degree of certainty demonstrate a connection between evidence and a specific individual or source. So what the report is saying is not that no forensic discipline outside of D DNA could be scientifically validated, but just that there really hasn't been an adequate effort to do that sci those scientific validation studies for any method, and that includes fingerprint evidence. So let's look at a couple of examples of disciplines that have been pretty wholly discredited, just to kind of give you an idea of um, how this kind of science can go wrong. Um, hair microscopy was a discipline that was used for many years before DNA technology became available and before DNA testing could be done on hairs. Um, and what um, forensic scientists would do is they would take a crime scene hair, like for example, if there was a hair found on the bed sheets at the scene of a rape, um, and they, they would take that hair and they would, then they would compare it to multiple hairs from the suspect. And they would look at those hairs under a high powered microscope and then make conclusions about whether the hairs matched each other, whether they had enough commonalities to be declared a match. And experts would come into court and they would say things like this, these hairs matched in every observable microscopic characteristic. Based on my experience in the laboratory and having done 16,000 hair examinations, my opinion is that they came from the defendant. And if you really take apart that language, the expert is not saying that there have been these scientific validation studies that have actually studied you know, what, um, um, what kind of patterns when in hair are common or uncommon in the population. Um, to what extent is the technique reliable? Um, what is its error rate? There had never been those sort of underlying validation studies and yet experts would come into courtrooms and then they would make these kind of statements that really just touted their own experience and the volume of cases they had done as a way to engender trust in the jury. But what happened when DNA did become available is that some of these hairs in old cases were now subject to DNA testing. And what we learned is that very often these experts just got it absolutely wrong. So I mean, there are extreme cases where experts declared a match and then what DNA showed is that one hair was actually a dog hair and the other came from a human being. Um, it's you know, based on a number of exonerations in this discipline, the FBI at some point conceded error in 22,000 cases in which FBI experts had generated reports using this discipline of hair microscopy. So let's look at one case example. Kirk Odom was somebody um, who was wrongly convicted of rape in Washington, D.C., and the rape victim had not gotten a good look at the perpetrator. She had been blindfolded through almost the entire incident. She only got a brief glimpse of the perpetrator in the dark. Um, but the state built their case around the fact that a hair found on her nightgown supposedly matched Mr. Odom, and the expert from the FBI came into court and again touted his experience and then he said that he had examined thousands of hairs in his career and said it was rare that he found as exact a match as exact a match as he observed in Mr. Odom's case. After serving 21 years in prison, Mr. Odom was exonerated when those hairs were subjected to DNA testing. So another example would be bite mark evidence. This is another discipline that was used for many years is less common now, but has not been completely excluded from American courtrooms. There are courts that will still let this evidence into court. But basically what the discipline assumes is that we all have dental characteristics that are unique and that skin can reliably capture the distinctive features in different people's um, um, dental patterns. So, for years, this evidence was introduced in courtrooms, and it wasn't until more recently that there has been an attempt to do actual scientific validation studies to, to explore whether either one of these assumptions is correct. And what the studies have shown is that, in fact, um, dental characteristics are not as unique as what the discipline purported them to be. Um, and that skin actually grossly distorts impressions. And so, 
um, just because of the medium of a person's skin, um, that actually you can have somebody who has a missing tooth and the way that their bite mark will appear on skin, you will not detect that there's a missing impression at that position in the mouth. Or conversely, that somebody um, um, can have just some other distinctive feature that does not appear on the bite mark. Um, some of the studies also showed that analysts can't even reliably determine whether a mark came from human teeth. So all of these um, revelations came to the forefront when again these studies were finally done. And also that um, when they tested experts showing them the same kind of impressions, there was wide variation among experts of whether they would even say th that they came from the same source. An example of a wrongful conviction in that discipline is somebody named Ray Crone. This is an Arizona case. And um, Mr. Crone had no criminal record. He was a um, postal worker. Um, he became a suspect in this brutal rape and murder of a woman that worked in a bar merely because he had been at the bar last, that night and had been one of the last people to leave the bar. Um, there was a bite mark on the victim and almost the whole case against Mr. Crone turned on that bite mark. He had very crooked teeth that were quite distinctive and the police made much of this and said that it was very conclusive evidence that this mark on the victim's body could have only come from him. Um, he was actually sentenced to death for this crime and spent some time on Arizona's death row. He was at some point given a new trial because his lawyers discovered after trial that the state had actually suppressed evidence that the first bite mark expert that the state had, had consulted had said that it was not a match to Mr. Crone. So he got a retrial, but at that retrial, the state trotted out their bite mark expert again and the jury convicted him again but this time he was sentenced to life in prison. And after serving more than 10 years, he was finally exonerated by DNA, but the state still did not want to give up. And what they did is they went to the person who was in prison, um, this other suspect that the DNA did match to, and they offered him a really sweet deal if he would just say that Mr. Crone committed the crime with him. And the man refused to do that. And finally, the state of Arizona um, let Mr. Crone go. Um, so, you know, as the NAS report says, I mean, DNA is the gold standard, but it's not foolproof. And so, you know, that's something else to keep in mind that a lot of these pattern disciplines, you know, there are real questions about their scientific validity. Um, but, you know, DNA is not the gold standard in every case that we believe it to be. In a lot of cases, biological evidence will actually contain a mixture of different people's DNA. And there's a lot of subjectivity to separating mixtures. And so basically what happens is if you have multiple people's biological material mixed in a single sample, that what DNA does is it looks at um, across 13 different loci of the human genome. And each of us has two alleles at each of these um, loci. And so if you had a DNA mixture of six people, you'd have six different alleles at each locus. And it would be up to the DNA analyst to determine which two alleles belong to which of the three people. So you can imagine that if you're trying to kind of separate it out and assign these attributes to different um, profiles, that there's not um, absolute certainty in doing that. And there's also a risk of what we would call contextual bias. So there's these studies that show that depending on the information that the analyst has and, and what they kind of expect or want the result to be and who it will implicate, this can really affect how they engage in this sort of subjective analysis. The other thing about DNA um, to keep in mind is that DNA can be transferred. And so finding DNA you know, on a particular object you know, is not ironclad proof of when we don't always know exactly when the DNA was placed there. And you know, these two examples I'm about to give you, I mean, certainly um, they're more the outliers or they're, not, they're the more rare examples, but it's just something to keep in mind when you think about the certainty or lack of certainty of DNA evidence. So the first example is actually a case that happened at Yale University. There was a graduate student that was murdered and her body was found behind a wall in a university laboratory. And um, 
the police actually generated two different profiles from the scene. Um, one profile was found on the waistband of the victim's underwear, and it matched this man who had died two years before the crime occurred. And so the police were really baffled, and they wondered how could it be that this dead person's DNA somehow ended up on the victim's underwear. And what they ended up figuring out after a lot of investigation is that this um, man to whom it matched had actually worked um, as a construction worker in the university laboratory a couple summers before. And he had spent a lot of time in this area where the victim's body was found. And it was actually a closed off area. So after he worked there, it really wasn't um, exposed to the elements. So whatever of his DNA was there was more likely to be preserved there and ended up being transferred to the victim's body. Another example is a case of somebody named Lucas Anderson, and this was a fairly recent California case. And what happened is there was a brutal murder in um, the South Bay of um, the San Francisco Bay Area, and there were multiple suspects and multiple people's DNA found at the scene. But there was DNA found on the murder victim, on the murder, murder victim's hand or fingernails um, that matched Mr. Anderson. And Mr. Anderson was an alcoholic. He suffered frequent blackouts and he didn't actually remember um, where he was that night and couldn't rule out that he had been there. And he came to question whether he might have been there. Um, but he was charged with a capital offense and he had great lawyers appointed to him. And as part of their preparation, they got all of his medical records. And what they ended up finding out is that he had been in the hospital at the time of the crime. So again, this was one of those instances where somebody had, despite the DNA match, which we would otherwise view as being absolutely conclusive, now there was this ironclad alibi. And so in an effort to figure out like how his DNA could have been at the scene, what authorities ended up determining is that that night, um, Mr. Anderson had been highly intoxicated and an uh, ambulance and EMT picked him up and brought him to the hospital. And later that same night, that same EMT went to the murder scene and inadvertently transferred Mr. Anderson's DNA to the victim's body. So again, you know, it's just um, food for thought that, you know, even with um, what we think of as the gold standard of DNA, it's not um, without error or potential error. So the final part we wanted to talk about, but pretty quickly, is litigating innocence. What's the difficulty with it? And to start with that, I know a lot of you are lawyers, but I thought I'd run through just a quick appellate chain and explain how you would even get back into court. So I think many of you may have remember seeing this in law school at some point, maybe not this well put together. But after you go to court, that's your trial court level up here. That's where your trial is. If you're convicted, then you have a right of an appeal to the Colorado Court of Appeals. Following that, if you are, um, if they don't overturn your conviction, then there's a petition for certiorari that you can file to the Colorado Supreme Court. If that is granted, um, then obviously you can, if the case can then be appealed to the Supreme Court, or even if it's denied, at that point, you can ask for permission to appeal it to the United States Supreme Court. Um, and that's really the first part of direct appeals. I think that's what it was about, and it's very straightforward. The thing after that that happens is something called a 35C, or a petition for post-conviction relief. And that's really where you start to see claims of newly discovered evidence or claims of innocence start to be raised. Um, and one of the first questions that people have is what are the time limits to be able to get in and file a motion for post-conviction relief? Um, in Colorado, the time limit is generally three years, except for if it's a first-degree murder conviction, then there's an unlimited, there's no statute of limitations. And the second question is often, do you have the right to counsel? Um, obviously, for the first set of appeals, you do have the right to counsel. Everyone in the United States does. But once you finish your first line of appeal, then your right to counsel is conditional. You have to be able to show the court that there is good cause or potentially a good claim on your behalf. And the person filing that is a pro se defendant. So you can start to imagine the difficulties that happen, both with a time frame 
and also with not having having that first petition or the first ask to the court for relief being filed by a person who is pro se. And once that's filed, then obviously it follows the same chain all the way down, either with a lawyer or without a lawyer. And again, you can see with a person who may not have been able to write a petition for relief that was sounded very good, that was very educated themselves English is not their first language if they are not highly educated if they are mentally um, if they have mental difficulties or if they have other types of um, disabilities how hard it is to get from that first direct appeal to post-conviction to getting a lawyer to passing all the way through that and then finally there is the ability to ask the federal court to look at a person's conviction and that'd be a federal petition for habeas corpus and um, there are very strict timelines that are fairly confusing and detailed, but it's about a year, <laughs> but it's fairly complicated. I'm not going to go into it. But again, this is a stage where most people are pro se, and it has the same or different language used, but it's similar in the sense that you have to show some type of good cause to be able to even have an attorney appointed to look at your case. So again, most people are doing it at this point pro se, meaning on their own. So you see petitions that are handwritten in pencil, filed with the court, um, and asking for claims of relief. I think the other thing that people need to be aware of is that during this direct appeal process, I think as you remember from law school, that the things that courts are looking at is not the facts. Um, and that can be very confusing to pro se litigants, especially especially people who are innocent, is that if you're innocent and you got convicted, what you want to be talking about continuously is, I'm innocent, factually, they got it wrong. They got it wrong, they got it wrong. But I think as folks can remember from your years in law school, that's not what the court is looking at. At some level, a court would just be like, denied, the jury found you guilty. But so instead, what they're looking at is what I think a lay person would find is procedural stuff. So was the process fair? Did they have a fair trial? Did the judge make mistakes in ruling on this piece of evidence or that piece of evidence? And you cannot, in that direct appeal process, really ever litigate the facts again. The facts are presumed, and they were resolved by a jury in favor of the prosecution. Um, and again, the only way that you're going to ask, get a court to look at it is look at it indirectly. But again, you're looking at the actions of the court. So did the court violate the defendant's due process by suppressing exculpatory evidence or keeping evidence away from the defense that they should have had? Again, when you get to that level of 35C, you can see pro se defendants once again saying, hey, okay, we're finished with that. But now, come on, someone look at the fact that I'm innocent. I didn't do this and writing lots of factual information. But again, the only way that they're gonna get counsel appointed, the way that they're going to get um, courts to relook at these issues is to couch them in legal terms. And that's very hard for pro se defendants to do on their own. So essentially, um, they're going to be saying to the court, my counsel was ineffective because they didn't present or find any of this evidence that I kept telling them to find that uh, to show I was innocent. They didn't ask for testing. They didn't go and get an expert that would have found this. And again, it, it's a very difficult and it's a very high bar because in our American justice system, there is extreme deference played, paid to the trial level fact finder, to the jury on all factual determinations. At some level, there is, it's really pushed back. The jury already heard the evidence. The jury already found you guilty. We are just looking to make sure the process itself was fair. Do you want to do the next part? So what happens if new evidence of in innocence emerges after a trial or after obviously a conviction? Um, so essentially the thing to know is that states have very different procedures for if, how, when a petitioner can seek relief based on the finding of new evidence. Um, but is the basic issue is, um, again, what we talked about, is there a time limit for raising it? Most states have fairly strict time limits. There's requirements the defendant ex exercised due diligence in how they did it. And then finally, there's this but-for type of test. So 
but for this kind of reasonable fact founder would have found the applicant or the person guilty of the underlying offense. So it's not just that there's evidence that could have been presented to a jury to show their innocence. It really has to be very persuasive evidence. And that's really where you see innocence projects start to come in. And I know we're running short on time. So I'm gonna turn it over to Anne-Marie to talk a little bit about our project and then to start answering your question. Okay, so the Corey Wise Innocence Project works just in Colorado. So for somebody to qualify for help from our project, they have to have been convicted within the state of Colorado. Um, because we're based, fortunate to be based at CU um, Law School, we're really lucky to be able to incorporate law students into everything that we do. And so we incorporate them into screening cases. And then once we move a case towards investigation or litigation, we always put um, one or two students on the case at any given time just so they can really um, have a rich experience of um, gaining um, just meaningful legal experience. We do DNA and non-DNA cases. We have a large number of applications that we get. And so just screening applications is a really time consuming process for us. Um, we're currently building a docket of cases and we're up to having uh, close to five cases that were either in litigation or very close to litigation. Um, and we've just recently um, launched a new effort to specifically identify cases in some discredited forensic disciplines. Um, we also do lobby for reform legislation. We're currently working um, with the Innocence Project, um, the National Project in New York, to push for a jailhouse snitch reform in Colorado that made it through one house of the legislature before the legislative session was suspended, but we're hoping that that moves forward when the legislature does come back in session. And we also have a project that some students are working on where we track compliance with some existing reforms just to make sure that on some reforms that have passed in Colorado on how interrogations are conducted and also on how eyewitness identifications are conducted that law enforcement is indeed complying with um, the letter of these new laws. So just in a nutshell, that's what we do. Um, we did have a video we were going to show at the end, but I think we should um, remove that from <laughs> the presentation because yeah. we went a little long and just go ahead and move to your questions because we're really eager to hear um, you know, any questions that you have about what we presented. So, Georgette, are you going to read, tell us? Okay. Yes, uh, okay. we have quite a few questions. I'll start uh, first. Those of you on Zoom can ask questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. You can also on the questions. Uh, we have quite a few. We'll see how many we can get through. Uh, Mario Nicholas uh, says, what are some of, or his question is, what are some of the best techniques you've seen for combating bias juries, um, uh, bias juries ha have for eyewitnesses? So I, maybe we'll trade off a little bit, but I would say um, one of the best is if a court allows you to have an expert. Um, but that I think as many practitioners know is very difficult to have in Colorado because many judges are not well educated in this or they believe that it's very commonsensical. And I think like many of us, unlike our very educated audience, and maybe that's starting to change throughout Colorado, but I think most people's perceptions is that this is common sense. It's just somebody who saw someone. I see them every day. And so, um, and that we're very good at this as people is um, identifying people. But if you can get a judge for you to have an expert that can talk about this, that's a very effective way. Another way is to introduce it in voir dire and talk to the jury about it because you'll often have other jurors who are much more like you all <laughs> who have learned about these areas and then also presentations like this where people learn about what's out there and then some of the media cases where people have been exonerated excellent alex clark question um and it just moved let's see <laughs> uh, might be off topic might be off topic but why is it legal for police to lie about evidence well, 
basically what courts have found is it doesn't violate the constitution for them to lie about evidence that that's not considered coercive in a way that would violate due process and so without that kind of constitutional limit on their conduct it would be up to individual jurisdictions to just have policies like a state could pass a law disallowing that um, or a particular police department could adopt policies um, disallowing that but it's very widespread in the United States because there isn't any constitutional restraint for police to lie to suspects. And I think what somebody on the other side would say is it's an effective tool to get guilty people to confess. And so that would be a way that they would justify um, being deceptive to a suspect. Thank you. Uh, Eden Roland asks, I, like many others, was moved by the films when they see us. I am a civil litigator and will never practice criminal law. For a person like me or for non-attorneys, what can we do to make a difference in this issue of wrongful convictions? Maybe I'll start just because it's my turn, but then I'll pass it to Emory. I would say a couple things that come to mind very easily are um, encouraging your legislatures to pass laws that look at some of the fundamental problems in our justice systems. So, you know, I would um, there's something called sequential lineups um, where you don't show people pictures, instead you show them one picture at a time. You have blind, you have officers who come in and give the lineups that they don't know who the suspect is, so they can't give any information. Those type of lineups are shown and there's no set number of them and they only show you one picture. So it gets rid of that idea is I'm supposed to pick one of these six people. That's shown to be a way to combat some of this. Um, but each kind of discipline has, has reform continuously being pushed through the legislature. So reaching out to legislatures when you hear about this and pushing them. And then obviously not to give ourselves a plug, but supporting innocence projects, the hard work that goes into um, hiring attorneys that can go back and try and look at these cases are important ways that um, we can combat that. I don't know if you want to add to that, Amory. Um, no, I just echo everything that you said. Um, yeah, I think just becoming educated and um, holding your legislators and your police departments. And, you know, there's so many people that we elect to positions, whether it's the DA, um, you know, we can, part of the accountability that we can create is um, demanding that people in those roles are sensitive to these issues. Thank you. Samuel Astorga has a question, a question for Professor uh, Moyes. Are some of these questions of memory applicable, applicable to other fields of law, specifically PI? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by PI. Should I know that? <laughs> Personal injury. Personal, Personal injury. injury. Okay. Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, I certainly would think, you know, to the extent that there are issues about how human memory functions, you know, whether it's witnessing a crime or being a victim of a crime and then reporting what happened or witnessing an accident. I mean, the same frailties of human memory apply in either instance. And um, you know, it was some, you know, that social science research can be brought to bear in either context. Very good. Uh, the next question is from Peter Sanders. Uh, there is a lot of incredible psychological research, much, much of it not generally known, involved in these cases. Where are the defense expert witnesses educating juries about these matters? We saw the same thing in the Weinstein case, uh, debu debunking the notion that ongoing relationships with perpetrators implies a lack of crime, assault, et cetera. So I, I guess my answer would be that, um, you know, just like all of us defense attorneys um, are learning about the limits of science and the limits of many of these disciplines, um, both the psychological information and the scientific evidence as it goes. Um, you know, I know that when I first pra started practicing um, quite a long time ago, it was very common that hair microscopy um, was an accepted discipline. And you really couldn't find an expert, even though right now that seems insane. Now that we had DNA and you're like, oh, of course this is not something. Or you would get up and argue it wasn't valid science. But 
the state's expert was so powerful and sounded so credible. And I think some of it is that we're all learning this at the same time. But um, so I think that's part of where you see some of the fallibility of this um, and why there weren't experts at the time. And the other is that there is a hesitancy often of judges to allow it to become a battle of the experts at some level. And so if a field feels commonsensical, like a lot of social science research does, then judges are hesitant because they don't want the experts to come in and take the place or the correct role of the jury. So it's kind of a fine line, right? Because I mean, when we all learn so social science research, we're often like, duh, yeah, I knew that but we didn't necessarily know it. And especially when it goes against our tendencies. And so I think as fields develop, it lets us look back on cases. Um, but I think remembering that we're kind of all litigating in the moment. So I hope I'm answering your question. Yeah, Anne-Marie, I don't know. Oh, definitely. I think the only thing I would add is there have been studies that even when a defendant is allowed to present an expert, that it's not particularly effective. So you would want to believe that if a defendant had an eyewitness expert, that that would diminish kind of the force of that um, identification, or that if a defendant had an expert on false confessions, it might um, give the jury sort of a pathway to maybe rejecting what is a false confession. But the studies actually show is it's still just really hard for juries to overcome when they see a victim you know basically stand up in court and say that's him or when they see a confession that's rich in detail and consistent with um, the offense that juries have a hard time rejecting that kind of evidence even when experts are presented thank you the next question is from Camille if someone has been wrongfully convicted is there a legal consequence on law enforcement? Depends. <laughs> I will uh, say rarely, right? And so, rarely, you know, yeah. do you want to answer it? I would say rarely. I mean, you saw the Fort Collins case, um, the Masters case, and there was a case filed against the lead detective who had not turned over, and I'm, I might be misstating this just slightly, and I apologize. Um, but who had been involved in knowingly not turning over some of the exculpatory evidence to the defense um, and then testifying wrongly. He was actually charged with perjury at one point after all of this. Interestingly, his case was dismissed for lack of evidence, um, but that was something brought against them. But at least in my experience, that's pretty rare. Emory. Yeah, I mean, it, my specialty is not civil rights and the kind of suits that are brought by people that have been exonerated. But what is true is that prosecutors individually have absolute immunity and can't be sued individually. And, you know, that it's challenge, it's difficult to make a case for relief. And so, you know, a lot of people who have been wrongly convicted end up either not being compensated at all or they end up having to rely on state statutes that set up a compensation scheme but often states erect some pretty substantial hurdles that the person has to get over before they could be compensated. And so often there's a fight just to be compensated and it's certainly not automatic. Okay, our next question is from Stephanie Gonzalez. Are the five to 10 inquiries a month from prisoners claiming innocence in Colorado in line with the statistics of 5% total convictions being wrongful? Well, I would have to do the math on that, um, but I think it's, I think we're, we're, we're getting a fraction of folks who might be wrongly convicted. Um, but, you know, I mean, one of the things we wrestle with as a project too is that we get letters from people that qualify and people that don't qualify for our help. And so sometimes people will write us with some account of injustice that happened to them. And we only help people that are factually innocent and had no involvement whatsoever. And so sometimes somebody will write to us and say that they did commit the underlying act, but that it was in self-defense, which is a legal defense. And we generally would not help somebody in that category that doesn't qualify as being what we would call factually innocent. And so, you know, there's a sort of a winnowing process on our end of having to like deal with this, we kind of talk about it like a funnel, that there's a funnel of applications and we kind of are screening them out on based on different criteria to get to the cases where we might actually be able to make a difference. Thank you. Uh, Van Michael Moore, 
Do judges typically allow jury instructions regarding the possibility of false confessions resulting from certain interi inter interrogation techniques? So judges have allowed them. Um, and it's something that an attorney would fight for, especially if they had a good claim, if that was their theory of defense. Um, they would both present it in their own theory of defense that they get to have, and they would ask for a, an instruction on that. Um, again, it's up to an individual judge as to whether they're going to permit it. I don't know if you want to add something, Anne-Marie. Um, no, that sounds right to me. Uh, Mary Beasley, after a defendant is acquitted, what responsibility does the state have to repay grievances and repair the destroyed public image and lost time, not to mention psychological distress? So I think Henry just talked about that a little bit, but I can try and just add a little. A lot of times what will happen is that the individual will ask for compensation in two ways. One, they will bring a civil lawsuit against the state, against the prosecutor, not individually as a person, but as their office, and against the police department, against everyone who brought, you know, prosecuted their case. Those cases can be incredibly difficult to win because there's a higher, you know, our government officials, we've granted them legislatively very, a lot of immunity. And so you really have to start showing higher levels, things such as bad faith, things such as hiding evidence intentionally. You know, you have to show a heightened level to get over this big amount of governmental immunity that we have granted people in positions such as prosecutors' offices and police. The other is, as Anne Marie mentioned, there are state statutes that allow for reparations. Um, and then a lot of times it's up to what is settled for. So sometimes there's, you know, settlements that are reached that such as X amount per year. Um, can be given to a person for how much time they spent in prison. I don't know if Anne-Marie, you want to add to that or? No, that's, yeah, I agree that that's a good summary. <laughs> okay, we'll take one more question. We do have more questions in the queue. Uh, so maybe we can um, answer these questions um, another way. But uh, given our time constraints, the last question is from L. Joseph. Uh, do the problems with memory and false ID occur only with stranger on stranger crimes? Is there research on this? So I will tell you that the focus is often on stranger crimes, right? Because it's a different set of things that are going on when you're looking at someone that you already know. Um, it's really much more of a recognition question, but of course the issues as to memory. So you could play out a scenario where you thought you recognize someone you know, and that all of the factors that we were talking about about memory um, would come into place. But I think where you've seen the cases play out more often is cases where they, people don't know each other. Now, it's not an underlying necessity, because right, you can look at um, what could have led to that. So right after something, are they having trouble remembering or were they blindfolded? I mean, there's, there's lots of scenarios, and then they think they, saw someone that they knew um, as opposed to that. So that can also lead into misidentification. Um, so it's not necessarily stranger stuff, but it's a context where you would see, a, you know, where you're trying to identify someone. Um, and generally it's harder to identify someone that you have never seen before and there's problems. I don't know, Anne-Marie, if I answered that well, maybe you wanna. No, I think that's to... just right. I mean, I think that sometimes, um witnesses might have had um, some sort of um, minor exposure to somebody before. Um, I mean, certainly if it's somebody that you know well and you're identifying them, you know, it's, and I don't think anybody's gonna really question your memory of who, who it was, but like Anne's suggesting, sometimes there are cases where somebody might have known somebody from the neighborhood and then when they get just a glimpse of the perpetrator during a crime, they might come to believe it was that person, but you know, all these issues of contamination and you know, how stress affects memory, et cetera, could still come into play. Thank you. I'd like to invite Dean Anaya. Hi. Wow, what a terrific presentation. And thanks everybody for, for those questions. Um, we really do appreciate Anne-Marie 
and Anne's insights, knowledge, and and the inspiration that they've they've come, they've, they've given us with their presentation. Um, for those of you interested, you can support uh, Cor the Corey Wise Innocent Project uh, by going to colorado.edu slash law slash KWIP. Again, colorado.edu slash law slash KWIP. Um, uh, thanks again, Anne-Marie and, and Anne, uh, for a terrific presentation. I really do appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, Maybe we could uh, clap virtually here. Now, ordinarily, if this were our in law, uh, is, is my uh, video on? It's not. Sorry. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah, and no, I was saying maybe we could clap virtually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if this was uh, one of our ordinary in person um, color wealth talks, we'd now uh, retire to a reception where we'd be able to mingle and interact with the speakers and uh, uh, and enjoy each other's company. But anyway, that's not the case. Um, we'll have to look for other opportunities for that. And I'd like to everybody to let you know that uh, we have an upcoming Colorado Law Talks. You'll receive a link to the presentation and survey of this one and your thoughts with regard to this one are welcome. Uh, also, um, Colorado Attorneys, you will receive a link for a CLE credit. Like I said, we have an upcoming Colorado Law Talks. The next one is on May 13, uh, 2020. And it will feature uh, are uh, Professor Mark Lowenstein, who is the Associate Dean for Curricular Affairs and the Monfort Professor of Commercial Law. He will be speaking on uh, cases every business lawyer should know. So please join us uh, for that. Uh, go to our website and you get information uh, on that. Um, uh, thanks everybody for, for joining us and uh, all the best. Take care. <laughs>